Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to another episode of Glass Half Full, a podcast and a safe platform where we talk with a variety of teachers, entrepreneurs, spiritualists, uplifters, givers, shakers, and serenaders. Everyone has a lesson to learn and a lesson to share. Let's use our life experiences to enrich someone's heart, mind, spirit, and soul. Through sharing our experiences, we can be a learning inspiration for one another. I'm your host, Chris Levins. Let's welcome today's guest. Today's guest is Miss Sarah M. Sarah has life lessons and gained wisdom that impacts others due to her experience of surviving the mass genocide of Cambodia. Her inspirational award-winning book, How I Survived the Killing Fields, was honored in 2015. As a speaker, she shares how tenacity, perseverance, and faith are required values to conquer fear and reach success. Sarah speaks to help listeners refocus build confidence, and develop self-leadership at conferences, seminars, churches, schools, television, podcasts, radios, and more. Let's give a warm welcome to Sarah M. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, Chris. Thank you so much for taking some time out to talk with me today. We really appreciate having you as a guest on Glass Half Full. It's my pleasure to be here talking with you. Thank you. How's your morning going so far? It's pretty nice. <laughs> the, the weather is perfect. So can, can you I, tell everybody where are you in the world? Uh, I am in Tampa Bay, Florida, United oh, States. The sunny state. Yes. <laughs> beautiful oh well we're gonna jump right in if that's okay yep my first question i like to ask all of my guests i feel that our lives are in spiritual design can you tell us your blueprint or your how you grew up um your family um how many in your home siblings okay sure um, I grew up in Cambodia. Um, I'm, I was the first child in my family when I, when I remember, but I'm not the only child later on. Okay. But we grew up in the countryside. My families, my parents are farmers, but my, my parents value education. So they groom us not to be a farmer. Mm. They encourage us to stay in school, do well, and hopefully eventually you'll get a good job. Oh, now the farming is hard work. So that's that where how I grew up with. Hmm. Now you say farming. Um did you all have a large farm? Was it something that was passed down through generations? Yeah, we have a large rice farm uh, passed down from my grandparents. So, wow. Okay. Um, I know that we're getting to the focus of your what you've been through and all that. Can you explain to everyone what are the killing fields? The killing fields happened when the communist Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia. See, Cambodia used to be a kingdom, a country. We have the king and queen, but the the Khmer Rouge communists bring the uh, communism into the country Mm -hmm. and came in, they took all of us prisoner so we are under their captivity and they just push us to work extremely hard. They starve us and we were exhausted. 
many of us are extremely sick. So I myself have serious sickness, multiple of them at one time, and I almost died. So that's that's uh, basically is uh, the killing field. It just starve people, it, uh, push people to work extremely hard, and then mm, they kill a lot of intellect and a lot of uh, former employees of the former government. Mm-hmm. So the mass killing field, that's, uh, that was really scary. Oh, my gosh. And this happened, it wasn't, you weren't a child, correctly. You had gone away to school, if I'm correct, to university. Your parents had sent you away to university at the capital city. Yes, yes. I was away for college. My college was in the capital city. That is about three to 400 miles away from my hometown. Wow. And when the Khmer took over, I was trapped. I want to come home to be with my family, but but they they cut down all the transportation and the communication line. So I have no way to to communicate with my family to know what happened to them, where they are, and all that. Nothing. Wow. We we were in complete separation in the dark for for a long time. Mm. So you were with other people from your university at this point when it's, it began and you started to travel. I guess there were people that you had gone to class with that were with you? Not really with the people from the university. See, the day that they come in, we we did not have school that day. So we were at our own place. Okay. So I was not in the classroom. Wow. And... W- when they come in, they start to evacuate the people from the whole city. So later on, I found out it's not just the capital city that was evacuated. It's the whole country. Mm. Oh, my gosh. I was um, among the, the people in the city. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And they were killing the educated. That was correct, right? Yes. Wow. My gosh. Can you, going back there, um, if you can take us back for a moment, can you tell us as you begin to march, um, what is it that you're thinking might be happening to you at this time? They start, you're starting to evacuate the city. In your mind, what are you thinking well, while walking in under the intense heat in the tropical country, uh, physically I was miserable, hmm. and mentally I was just everywhere, and all I can think about was my family. Where are they? Hmm. Oh, mom! My my mom just recovered from a four years of paralysis. Wow. Yeah, she had an accident and she became paralyzed for more than four years. And uh, during the time that the communists took over, she she was just recovered from paralysis. And I had been a caregiver for her for all the time that she had been sick in bed. But now that I'm I'm away from her now that this situation happened. I want to go back home so much mm-hmm. to be with them so that I can help out. And that was all I had been thinking about. And I just so, so, so sad that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go home. I could not uh, tell them that I'm all right. It's it just like, Nothing I can do except thinking and crying. Oh, my gosh. And how old are you at this time? I was um, 21. Wow. My gosh. So young. So young. 
So you begin the journey, you, you're walking, and they're taking you somewhere. Where are they taking you? They push us to go as far as possible from the city. So first I end up in the remote village far enough. So um, they let us stay temporarily with the villagers. Mm -hmm. Later on, they start to, to take people to places that not enough people. So um, I end up this place two times and eventually I end up in a big labor camp. You were there at this big camp for about four years. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Wow. So can you explain to everyone, what are they, what is your day? What was the day like? You'd wake up. The day, the day like uh, when, when we wake up, it's 4 a.m. Mm. They, they ring the bell at 4 a.m. and we line up ready to go to work. And work is in the rice field. And we bend down all day, either planting the rice or harvesting the, the rice. And it depends on the season. Mm -hmm. And in that extreme hot sun for about 15 to 16 hours. Oh, my gosh. And for that long day, we were giving very little food to eat. So the food is just... <clears throat> Barely, barely half of our stomach. And also, we don't have time to rest. We work all the time. And when, when, they, when we finished our day, we went to a place to rest. Before we go to sleep, they have a mandatory meeting every night. The meeting, the goal of the meeting is to see if anybody, see anybody else disobey the rule. Their rule is very long list. You cannot do this, 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 this. So the goal is just to make sure that we are obeying the rule. Oh my gosh. And then go to sleep. Yeah, by the time we go to sleep, it's a Pretty close to midnight. Hmm. And so tell that, us about the sleeping area, your sleeping quarters. Oh, yeah they they put all the the woman in one place and the man in one place. So in each of our tents, we have about hmm, ten people. Okay. Ten feet in people, and we just lay down uh, one next to the other. There is no room separating us. We just just sleep on the floor. And that's it. And there is no mosquito net. You know, in Cambodia, so there are a lot of mosquito, and there is no net. So we sleep in the, in the open air, so the mosquito can come and bite us all night long. Oh, my gosh. Uh, wow. That's an added torture, for sure. Yeah. So you're there in this, the large camp, for about four years. In this time, I'm sure you are seeing people slowly disappear. The numbers are starting to go down. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. People die left and right. And um, when they they kill people, um, it's now part of our camp. We, we don't know. I did not see. But people just disappear. Whatever they accuse those people for, mm -hmm. they just disappear. But in some region of the country... They, they kill people right in the open. You know, some villagers can see them, wow. how they kill. 
Yeah, some of my uh, Cambodian uh, people that I know of, some of them have witnessed the killing of their own family. Mm. So they, they cannot forget that. But you know, that's that's a horrible thing to see and to be left with. Yes, yes. And I I I praise God every night that I don't I don't want to see that. Whatever they do, please do not see. Please do not let me see. So I'm so grateful that I did not get to see that. Hmm. Oh my yeah. gosh. Wow. And so what is it that you're wearing? What is the wear? Are, do, are there shoes? Are you able to have? Yeah. Um, the clothes, they give us the black black pants and long sleeve shirts. Hmm. And everybody wear black. Uh, we have a pair of shoes. The shoes that made off rubber the tired uh oh like rubber rubber shoes yeah yeah the rubber shoes mm. which of course in heat oh. you sweat in rubber yes yes wow were there punishment for stealing? I'm sure people tried to maybe take some of the rice or were people just too afraid to even do anything of that well, we cannot steal from the kitchen. They have a, a kitchen that the cook um, prepare all the food to to feed us. Um, originally, in this big camp, there was a thousand of us, mm-hmm. all single men and women, one thousand. And we have they have the cook, they have the kitchen the, to um, do the food for us. But people. Um, go out at night to try to find something to supplement because we were starving. All of us are starving. But to go out to look for extra food is against the rule. Mm. There are a lot of fruit fruit trees in um, the area that we were staying, like mango, oranges, and guava. Um, Some of them ripe and fall to the ground, Mm -hmm. but the rule, we are not supposed to pick up those fruits. Can you imagine we were starving? We were, you know, we want to eat anything, Mm. but cannot pick those fruit on the uh, the ground. We have to wait until the kitchen staff gather all the fruit and divide it up and distribute equally amount us oh my gosh wow yeah what were you most afraid of while you were there well i'm afraid that i will be separated from my family forever Hmm. i'm afraid that um this thing keep going for for a long time that Hmm. i might be able to go home Okay. So your family yeah. is what you were thinking about. Yes, my family is the number one in my in my mind. Do you feel that kind of kept you alive? Yes, of course. Yes. It it was the hardest punishment to keep me away from my family. But it's also it's the blessing that have a beautiful family to look forward to be reunited with. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell me about the, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. Can you tell me about being reunited with your family? How did it happen? Where were you? Oh, it's the long step before I reunited. But uh, to answer your question, eventually I had to escape from this camp. Yeah. Um. I gather three, three close friends, mm-hmm. and I, I ask them to escape with me. Okay, this so is, tell us about the escape, and then we'll lead into the family question. Okay, yeah. 
the escape happened when they moved the camp to the jungle. So uh, around about four years into this, there are something, some commotion going on. There are some gun sound, some uh, something not stable. So the the leader of the camp demand that all of us pack up our little belonging and move. So they give us a big bag of rice to carry, and then we move into the jungle. So um, we keep moving every two weeks. We move, and then we we stop for a little bit, and then we move again. So keep moving into the jungle, and I realize that, oh, my goal is to go back to Badambong. That's the my the the city that I grew up. Your in. hometown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to go to Badambong, and now they move us to the jungle. This is not where I want to be. I will be separate from my family forever <laughs> if I keep going with them. So I decided I had to do something. I cannot keep staying with this group and I cannot I cannot die in the hand of this group. Hmm. So that's where I get motivated to gather three close friends and I say, hey friend, we need to escape. Do you come with me? Would you come with me? And all three of them say yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. And we are all women and we are in bad shape, you know. Uh, I was the in the worst shape. I was so skinny. And that's why I need friends because my, my physical my physical health is not going to support me to travel hmm. for a long distance. We it it's going to be a long journey. So I need a friend to support me. So that's why I gather my friend and they they want to go with me. So they we wait until nighttime and then you know we we sneak out very really fast. So in the jungle there is no light. So when it's got dark, it's dark. It's dark. You cannot see anything. Mm. So um that's how we escape. But um so to make a long story short, <laughs> we get out when the sun rise, we realize we turn around and we didn't see them. And we realize, oh wow, we made it. We wow. made it out. Oh, that was so exciting. And then we keep walking. And we have no idea where to go. Uh, so we just um, we just feel like this is where we came from. Like we feel like we backtrack of where we came from. Mm-hmm. We keep walking, and then eventually we saw some people. Mm. We saw some villager, um, and we keep asking for direction. We ask to have them show us where. Where should we go and how? What is the direction to go to Badambong, my hometown? Some people don't know how to tell us, and then we found some people who know. So they point us where to go. So we keep following them. We have been walking for a long time. Mm. Were you? Did you ask them for food as well, or we? Um, yeah, some villager was very kind that give us a little food. And then some of them helped me when at one point I have a very bad diarrhea and I couldn't go on. So they took us in for a night and then they feed us and then we keep going. Now, were they afraid that maybe they might be in trouble as well or there wasn't any fear for, for helping you? It seemed like they are they are not fearful anymore. Um, the, let me give you a glimpse of why these people are peaceful. Um, later on, I found out 
the country had been liberated for about four or five months oh. before I got out of the jungle. That's why they keep pushing us to the jungle. The rest of the country had been liberated. Wow. Yeah. So those people in the village, they know they have been liberated. Mm. And they are not under the captivities anymore. Wow. My gosh. Yeah. Mm. So can I ask you, what positive things did you hold on to during these dark years? The positive thing is the love. The love for my family. And the friendship that I began to build in the camp. You know, the the camp friend... They are in the same situation as I I was. So we start to care for each other and support each other. Hmm. And my love for my family is the number one. The one main reason why my love was so strong, remember I told you my mom was paralyzed for four years? Yes, ma'am. During those times, during that time that she was, Paralyzed, I was her full time caregiver. Mm. Care for her for all that year that what built the bond between us, my mom and I. Mom was very active. She's very busy. She never had a long time to be with me until the time that she was paralyzed. She could not go anywhere. Then she and I, we have time to talk, to share everything. So I, when I go to school, I remember some of the good jokes, some of the funny <laughs> stories, something fun to come home and share with my mom to cheer her up. So those four years help us to build such a wonderful bond with my mom and I. Wow. So, yeah, that's why I keep remember those, that time that I had with my mom. That keep me, keep me moving, keep me going that, you know, one of these days I will be with her. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks. So why is it that you decided to write the book? How I Survived the Killing Fields. Well, after I was able to escape, to come to the United States, after 35 years, I realized that some people who was close to me and they asked me about my background and I told their story, they was inspired. And then I real, and then I have one friend who lost her teenage child to suicide. Oh gosh. My heart was broken. And I was just so so sad with her. And I realized that, you know, this teenager, if they just know about my story know about how I struggle to save my life for my family, they might change their mind about taking their own life. Hmm. That's, that's what I was thinking. Wow. And I realized that maybe my story can help stop that suicidal the trend. Wow, that's so, so that, powerful. Yeah, that's the reason I wrote my book. Wow, that's excellent. Excellent. And I mean, sharing your hardship, and like you told me that it's not about the killing fields, it's about the obstacles in our lives that we have to get through. And yes, you know, that's a really powerful statement that you had mentioned to me before. And it's true, everybody does have something that they are dealing mm -hmm. with or have dealt with in their lives. And how we come out the other side is the key, right? Yes, yes. 
and how we look at the situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, when when I was in the middle of struggling in the killing field, I have a positive mindset. I I thought, you know, I was now thinking that I'm a victim, but in fact, I was a victim. But I'm now thinking that I was because I feel like, you know, at least they did not take me away to kill. At least they did not beat me up every day. Of course, they pushed me to work um, very hard, but they did not beat me up. And at least I have some friends in the camp with me. So I I can think of all the things that I'm grateful for. Yes. You know, in, no matter how bad the situation is, if you are looking for something good, you will find it. Mm. You will find and you will be grateful for. Mm. That's how we develop a positive mindset. You be grateful for whatever you have, no matter how little you have. Just be grateful. Mm. That is a powerful statement. It's true. When we go to gratefulness, it changes our mood. It changes everything when you when you think from that view. Sometimes it's hard to see from that, but when you get there, it's true. The, the thought of just being grateful for what you have, it could yeah. always be worse. Mm-hmm. Wow. And you can be depressed. Cannot be depressed while you are grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Those that, that's two things doesn't stay in the same room. It's true. <laughs> it's true. You're right. You're right about that. <laughs> I like that. Um, if you could speak to your younger self at this point now, what would you say to her? I said, you did a good job. Be faithful to family, loving and um, grateful for what you have. And you persevere. Mm -hmm. You endure the hardship because you have a purpose. Wow. So I wouldn't change a thing. Wow. Wow, Sarah. That's great. That's really great. Thank you. So can you bring us to how did you get into America? How did you how did you get back with your family? So we've 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 passed through, you're on your way searching for your home city. And please bring us to the day when you were able to meet your family again. Yes. Um when I walk so many miles and then finally get to my hometown and I went to where exactly my home used to be and my home was not there. Oh, wow. It was destroyed. Oh, no. And I learned later on that because our home is a little bit bigger than usual, so they, they tear down the big home they use the word to build a small, smaller home for people to stay, to live in. So when I could not find my home there and I was looking for my family and I couldn't find them and nobody know where they are because these are all the people that re, that return from the captivity and come to the city life again. So um, I thought very quickly and say, oh, I have an aunt who used to be a nurse back in the day when I was in a hometown. So I think maybe she's still here. Maybe she's at the hospital. So I went to the hospital. Sure, I found her. Oh, wow. I, I found my aunt and then she told me where my family moved to and so on. So that's the the backtrack of how I found my family when I got to find my family. My mom saw me first and I saw her and oh, we hug each other and we cry and then just, and then later on, my mom told me that she did not recognize me. 
Wow. The, the only thing that she recognized was my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> I I was in a bad shape. I was extremely skinny. So, but she quickly started to nurture me with her wonderful food. Um, my dad is good at planting, you know, the garden. So my mom prepared wonderful food to feed me. And I just, <laughs> you want to hear something so funny? Sure, sure. Uh, at that time, when she prepared the meal, I enjoyed the food and so on. And I said, well, you know, I have been so skinny for so long. Never again. I want to be skinny. I'd rather be fat than skinny. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get my wish. <laughs> 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 oh, we have to be careful what we are saying, what we are thinking. <laughs> it is so true. Be careful what we ask for. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Wow. So the, your mom and your dad were still alive. Yeah. And you also had an uncle who was a soldier. Was he yeah. still alive as well? No. No. Okay. I call my uncle. All the men in my family are gone. Even cousin, I lost two men cousin and three or four uncle. Oh, I'm sorry. My brother, my, my brother almost, almost gone. They, uh, one of my brother was on the list to be taken, to be killed. Oh my gosh. <sighs> wow. So. By God's grace, he was saved. Yes. Saved. Goodness. And so living in the United States now, when did you come to um, the United States? I came in 1981. Okay. I, I left Cambodia in 1980. Um, you know, I had to escape because at that time, the country was was still a mess. There is no airplane, there's no office, there's no way that I can get a passport or a visa or any kind. So in order to get out from the out of the country, I had to sneak out and escape. It's a dangerous route, but we have to do what we need to do. So tell us how is it that you were able to escape? Well, um, we live in this province that is close to the border of Thailand. Mm -hmm. And my mom have a cousin who is um, familiar with the, the road. And she make arrangement for me to go with him, to, to have him take me to the border. So we... We ran the motorcycle, and the motorcycle driver took us to the border. And then we would get close enough; he cannot, the motorcycle cannot go anymore. So we um, we look for people that want to go to cross the border. So we found some a few people, and we tag along with them. And we, we pay a guy, there is a guy who who know the route and mm -hmm. they take the money and we pay them and we went. So that's a very, uh, uh, also a risky, a risky deal because I heard some, some horror story that the guy, sometimes they did not take people to where, where they need to go. Oh and they. Gosh. They kill people and they steal rob. the money. Steal the money, but um, I feel like God was with me, hmm. protecting me from all the bad things like that. So when I get to the other side of the border, I reach the uh, 
the refugee camp. The camp was established by the United Nations okay. to receive the flood of the refugee that escaped from Cambodia. So I went to the camp, register myself, and then um, searching for my mom's cousin who had been in the United States for a, a long time as a student. Okay. So finally, yeah, finally I was able to make connection with him and he started to do the paperwork to bring me to United States. That's how I got here. Legally, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, what a testimony. What year did you yeah. think did you arrive here? Uh, 1981. 81, it took me right. more. Yeah, it took me more than a year waiting for everything to, you know, to be processed. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And so your mom and dad are they were left back in your hometown, and your yeah, brother but, as well. Yeah, my whole family was left behind, but a few years after I arrived in the United States. My mom and all my brothers also uh, escaped from Cambodia. Oh, okay. So, yeah, but their their journey is so much harder than mine because by then time by that time the camp was closed. Oh. They they stopped receiving the refugee. So the structure the the, the the tents and everything was still there, but there's no worker, there's no registration. Wow. But to make a story short, um, I found out later what I need to do in order to bring them here. So it took them five years living in hiding uh, in fearful situation. Five years. Wow, my gosh. Yes. That's a long time to be in hiding after all that had already happened. Right, right. Wow. And so um, today, and are your parents alive? My, uh, my mom lived with me for 13 years as, for me to care for her as her health started to decline. Hmm. But passed on nine years ago. Oh, okay, I'm sorry to, yeah. to hear that. Yeah, thank thank you. But but at least I had that precious time, the you know the last part of her life with me. That's beautiful. Yeah, and very cherishing. And your father? My father still in Cambodia. Oh, uh, wow. When yeah, when the whole family. Um, decide to escape. My dad was supposed to come with them, but and then he backed out at the last minute. I think I I never asked him why because I just live with live with as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think because he doesn't speak the language and he's older and uh, you know it will be hard hard for him to adjust to the new new country. Mm -hmm. So he decided to stay. Wow. Yeah. And tell us about your the new life starting in America. What um, is it that no you you decided to do with your life in America? Well when I first start when I first come here, it was very challenging because um, I don't, I did not speak English. So the first, uh, the, my first goal is to learn the English very fast mm -hmm. and then find a job, find something to do. So I found a job and then later on I I go get my GED. I study and take a test and I pass a test and get my GED to register for college again. Excellent. Because, yeah, when I came, I had nothing to prove. 
although I have been in college in Cambodia, but I have no paperwork to prove. So I had to to do everything all over again. But thank goodness my brain is still working. <laughs> <laughs> I I forget a lot mm-hmm. the because of the trauma, the situation. And um, during my sickness, I had high fever that um, I think somehow I damaged my brain a little bit. But okay. No. Yeah. From being sick? Yeah, from being sick. Wow. Um, yeah, I was able to register for college and then um, keep, up, keep up with college. And what did you study? I study mathematics. <laughs> you, you will laugh about this, but um, yeah, because everything else requires a lot more English than than math. Oh, math okay. is just oh. yeah. That's smart. Yeah, it's true. It's just numbers. Yes, and <laughs> I was keep telling my friend and said all those years I was in college. I was doing a lot of problem solving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true, right? It's true. It's true. It's true. I like that. So did you have to have any therapy? Did you go to any therapy at all? No. no. Wow. Even still to this day? Until this day. Wow. <laughs> Now, you know, that is amazing. That is amazing. And to be able to now to share your story, to help others, putting forth, you know, sharing your testimony. Very powerful. Yeah, I I appreciate that. I think uh, because I, I look at the positive side, I, um, like I mentioned earlier, Look for some goodness, something to be grateful for. Mm. Grateful. Because if we cannot find gratitude in anything, you cannot be happy. All right, now. Amen on that. That's the truth. That's the truth. What have you learned about forgiveness? I learn a lot about forgiveness. I I learned that in order for our life to keep move to move on, we have to get rid of negativity from ourselves. Mm-hmm. And forgiveness is the big negativity that to it's we should not keep that in our system. So to forgive, that means to get rid of that negative thought from our mind. Mm-hmm. That means let go. Let go and forgive the person who did it. Um, of just, just try in our heart to forgive people. It's true to free yourself. Yeah, to free ourselves, to... Um, to move on with our life, mm. to hold on to something better than than the bitterness. When you are not, when when you have something that you you don't forgive, that means you hold on to that bitterness, the anger, the resentment. Mm. Yeah, nobody wants to hold on to that. You want to be free. Yeah, yes, you have to be free. That's why I. I did not need the therapy because I have my my son, my belief, my belief that you know we have to be grateful for what you have. So I I still have my life, still have my family. I still now I'm able to come to United States, and it's just a lot of good things that I should be focusing on. Mm instead of focusing on the negativity. That's so true. So good. Such such good words spoken. Definitely. Can I ask you, what other services do you provide? 
I I help people um, to stay healthy. That's the wellness uh, business. But also, I'm also a speaker. Um, I do inspirational speaking, telling my story, giving my my input, my idea to help people to to have hope, to be more resilient, to be confident in their own life. Hmm. So that's uh, my speaking service. I love it. Nice. Yeah, and and my book, of course, my book. My, I I feel like my book is the good therapy for people because it's an inspirational book. In fact, that book uh, win me the award back in 2015. Mm-hmm. It's the most inspirational book in 2015 in Tampa. Wow, look at you. <laughs> yes, yes, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Final thought. Uh, I encourage our listener to look for something to be grateful for and try to get rid of any resentment, bitterness, and negativity from your system. Because if you are focusing on good things, you will find plenty of them. All right now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you <laughs> if you look for something good to be grateful for, you will find. Hmm. So that's, that's awesome. my, my thank mm-hmm. you, thank you. And one more question for you. I like to close with asking all of my guests: Is your glass half empty or half full? Oh, definitely, my glass is half full. Yes, it is half full. Hmm. Um. You, you can be grateful that you already have half of it. Already <laughs> have <laughs> It's true, right? You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Excellent mm-hmm. answer. Can you tell everyone how they can reach you, finding your book as well? Yes, definitely. Thank you for that question. Um, I have a website. It's called sarahim.com. S-A-R-A-I-M.com. Mm. And to get the book, you just um, go to the book tab. So all you can type in sarahim.com slash book. You will find the book. Okay, so we're just taking your website and then putting the slash plus the word book. Yes, yes. And uh, also I have some going on event um, that I'm hosting. You can go to the same website, just just uh, put slash events, events with an S. You can find some of my events. And one of them is the a live show on Facebook. Yeah, Thriving Conversation. The thriving Conversation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'm sure the viewers will be jumping out to check out your website as well as your book. And we are so grateful for you taking some time out to be a guest here on Glass Half Full. And we appreciate you sharing your story and, you know, going back through some of those times and just giving us inspiration, showing us that there is light when we feel that there is only darkness. And for us to continue to hold love and hope and courage in our heart and in our mind that with these tools, we will be able to get through any of the dark times and holding on to gratefulness as a, yes. as a call for our, us to remind us, to humble us back down and to refresh us. So thank you for your time here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me as your guest. You are so welcome, so welcome. It has been lovely and wonderful interview. We thank you so much. Welcome. And thank you to all our listeners for listening in to another episode of Glass Half Full. 
a podcast, and a safe platform for everyone to share their life experiences. Once again, I'm your host, Chris Levins. Please subscribe, follow, and rate this podcast on Apple Music for more learning experiences. Until next time, know you are blessed. See ya.